Good afternoon. My name is Jeannie and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome you to the APEI Reports fourth quarter 2023 results conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star one again. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to Chris Simonofsky, Investor Relations. You may begin your conference. Great. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to American Public Education's conference call to discuss fourth quarter 2023 results. Joining me on the call today are Angela Selden, President and Chief Executive Officer, Rick Sunderland, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Steve Summers, Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy and Corporate Development Officer. Materials for the call today are available in the Events and Presentation section of APEI's website. Statements made during this conference call and in any accompanying presentation regarding APEI and its subsidiaries that are not historical facts may be forward-looking statements based on current expectations, assumptions, estimates, and projections. Forward-looking statements may sometimes be identified by words such as anticipate, believe, seek, could, estimate, expect, can, may, plan, should, will, would, and similar or opposite words. Forward-looking statements include, without limitation, statements regarding expectations for registrations and enrollments, revenue, earnings and adjusted EBITDA and other earnings guidance, initiatives to improve NCLEX pass rates and reposition Rasmussen University for growth and other company initiatives, including with respect to future competition and demand and cost-saving efforts. Forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by such statements. These include, among other statements, the company's dependence on the effectiveness of its ability to attract students who persist and are likely to succeed, the ability to effectively market programs or expand in new markets, the reduction, elimination, suspension, or disruption of tuition assistance, changing market demands, economic and market conditions, the ability to meet regulatory and creditor requirements and the impacts thereof, challenges with acquisitions, the company's ability to meet cost savings goals, matters related to debt and preferred stock, and risks described in today's presentation, today's press release, APEI's Form 10-K for 2023, and other SEC filings. The company undertakes no obligation to update publicly any forward-looking statements for any reason unless required by law. This presentation contains references to non-GAAP financial information. A reconciliation between the non-GAAP financial matter, measures we use and the most directly comparable GAAP measures is located in the appendix to today's presentation and in the earnings release. Management believes that the presentation of non-GAAP financial information provides useful supplemental information to investors regarding its results of operations and should only be considered in addition to, and not a substitute for or superior to, any measure of financial performance prepared in accordance with GAAP. Now I'd like to turn the call over to APEI's CEO, Angela Selden. Angie, please go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining American Public Education's fourth quarter 2023 earnings call. Today, I am pleased to share details about three key themes. First, APEI has outperformed fourth quarter 2023 guidance on all financial metrics with better than expected performance from American Public University System, Rasmussen University, and Hondros College of Nursing. Second, Rasmussen and Hondros both have meaningfully improved pre-licensure NCLEX student outcomes 
for Q4 and full year 2023. Third, we are initiating full year revenue and adjusted EBITDA guidance for 2024, a reflection of our confidence in the outlook for 2024 and with investment areas that prioritize growth, academic quality, and student success. Before I provide more details on those three key themes, I would like to first recognize the extraordinary efforts of our faculty and staff across each of our education units and at APEI. They are delivering on our vision of transforming lives, advancing careers, and improving communities. I am particularly proud of our entire team's ability to respond to the year's difficult challenges and their relentless efforts to improve student outcomes. These efforts have resulted in remarkable improvements in 2023 and set the course for continued growth in 2024 and beyond. Now turning our attention to fourth quarter 2023 results, APEI's financial and operating performance exceeded guidance on all metrics. APEI's revenue exceeded the top end of our guidance range, reaching $152.8 million, and adjusted EBITDA exceeding our guidance by more than 50%, reaching $25.7 million, which is $8.8 million above the high end of the range, and marking the second consecutive quarter of meaningful adjusted EBITDA outperformance. I am particularly proud of how our education units have contributed to the outperformance, with APUS achieving record EBITDA margins and both Rasmussen and Hondros delivering positive EBITDA results. Earnings per share also saw significant growth, rising from a loss of $0.35 cents in the prior year period to a gain of $0.64 cents per diluted share in the fourth quarter. This 4Q23 financial and operating performance also reflects our continuous improvement efforts. Driven by operational changes we implemented throughout 2023. These changes include enhancing our marketing efficiency across all EUs, right sizing of the cost structure to our revenue base and in particular within Rasmussen, and successfully executing on the APEI shared services transformation that we began a year ago. Now let's turn our attention to APEI's education units, starting with APUS. In 4Q23, overall net course registrations increased 4% year over year to 90,700 registrations, which was at the top of our guidance range. APUS is strength with the military resulted in active duty registrations increasing by 5%, while veteran registration showed continued momentum with 13% year-over-year growth, a continued testament to the strong military franchise that AMU has built. Non-military registrations continue to be soft in both the competitive labor and higher ed markets for those students. The 4% increase in registrations in the quarter, combined with the positive impact of pricing actions earlier in 2023, partially offset by the mixed shift to lower revenue military enrollments, resulted in an 8% increase in revenue at APUS. However, this strong revenue performance, coupled with cost containment and lower marketing spend, resulted once again in strong margin improvement in the fourth quarter, with EBITDA increasing to $27.7 million from $20.6 million just a year ago. This resulted in a 35% margin for the quarter, as compared with 28% in the prior year period. Looking ahead to the first quarter of 2024, we expect total registrations at APUS to again increase year over year but at a slightly slower pace than 2023's very strong performance. I am proud to report that last month, AMU was named the 2024 Institution of the Year 
by the Council of College and Military Educators, CCME, for its dedication to educating active duty service members and their families. AMU was selected from over 2,000 institutions. This is the second time in 12 years that AMU has been honored with this award. From a regulatory perspective, APUS met the Department of Ed's 90-10 rule for 2023 with a ratio of 89%. As a reminder, 2023 was the first year that military tuition assistance and veterans education funding were included in the 90 portion of the calculation. Turning our attention to Rasmussen, the team delivered in 4Q23 the best bottom line performance in a year with positive EBITDA of $409,000, even while enrollments decreased 10% in the quarter. Additionally, on-ground nursing and health ed programs showed strong growth, including the BSN program up over 20%. RASMUS enrollments are finalized for the first quarter of 2024, and overall enrollment decreased just 6% as compared with double-digit declines for each of the last four quarters. Online enrollments were slightly positive, while on-ground health care enrollments declined 11%, driven primarily by declines in Rasmussen's ADN program. Please note that to more closely align our public reporting with how Rasmussen has been operating the university internally since the reorganization in late 2022, we will discontinue our public reporting of nursing versus non-nursing, effective next quarter, and shift to campus healthcare versus online reporting instead. For compatibility, we've included a table in the appendix of our 4Q23 earnings presentation. As for Rasmussen's 4Q23 NCLEX results, based on final scores reported for all states except Wisconsin, which has not yet reported, but where Rasmussen expects all four programs to pass, Rasmussen's on-ground pre-licensure nursing programs achieved or surpassed the respective state threshold for 26 of 29 programs, or 90% of all programs, in the fourth quarter 2023. This was up from about 80% in the third quarter and considerably up from 60% a year ago. For the entire year 2023 measurement period, 20 of 29 programs, or about 70% passed, which includes the preliminary results for Wisconsin, and that is over 20 points higher than a year earlier. Importantly, the trend has improved steadily each quarter since 1Q23. Even as Rasmussen has delivered much better scores over the past year, Rasmussen's Bloomington, Minnesota ADN program has continued to perform below state standards. As a result, Rasmussen has taken the difficult decision to voluntarily close the ADN program at this campus, effective in 1Q24, and has received approval from the Minnesota Board of Nursing to teach out this program by the end of 2Q24. Rasmussen had already stopped enrolling new students in the Bloomington ADN program as of the last quarter, and we expect minimal impact on enrollments and revenue, given that fewer than 50 students will still be in the program upon closing. While this has been a difficult decision to make, Rasmussen remains committed to offering strong nursing programs in the Twin Cities. As such, Rasmussen will focus on attracting BSN students to that location instead where Rasmussen has reported an over 90% NCLEX pass rate for BSN in the most recent quarter. This pivot to BSN also reflects the high demand for BSN nurses in the Twin Cities healthcare market relative to ADN nurses. Rasmussen expects further growth in its non-ADN health ed campus-based programs and the institution's more targeted programmatic marketing efforts are helping to drive improved enrollment in these areas by streamlining processes for identifying and attracting new students. At Hondros, 
it delivered record enrollment of 3,300 students in the first quarter of 2024, surpassing 3,000 enrolled students for the second consecutive quarter. Demand remains strong for its PN and ADN nursing programs, with the new Detroit campus continuing to perform very well. Legacy campuses, including Indianapolis, while still operating with enrollment caps as a new program, also contributed to growth. This robust enrollment growth has driven a strong top line, with revenue growing 25% in the fourth quarter 23 and 21% for the full year 2023. During 2023, Hondros implemented a modest price increase in the second quarter, reduced headcount to opt optimize operating costs, and delivered positive EBITDA of $1.1 million in the fourth quarter, compared to a loss of $700,000 in the prior year period. This represented a 7% margin, and with that strong fourth quarter performance, Hondros delivered positive adjusted EBITDA for the year of $400,000 as compared to a loss last year. Hondros maintained its track record of achieving high NCLEX scores in its PN program in 2023, and for the first time since 2014, has also reached the passing criterion for its RN program in Ohio. This achievement sets the stage for Hondros to have the opportunity to expand its ADN RN program to Indianapolis and Detroit, where that program is not currently offered. Additionally, in 2024, Hondros plans to begin offering a medical assisting program at all Hondros Ohio campuses. This will increase utilization of both these locations and prospective student leads and will lead to increased access to healthcare education for the local community population, which will also improve profitability. I would now like to turn our attention briefly to 2024. We are pleased to provide full year 2024 guidance for revenue and adjusted EBITDA. For revenue, we expect a range of 610 to $620 million. And for adjusted EBITDA, we expect a range of 55 to $65 million. In 2024, we are investing in several initiatives that we believe will strengthen our market position, set the stage for improved student experience and success, and will lead to additional growth. These areas include APUS, which is both investing in curriculum modernization to improve the student experience and satisfaction, and has announced the first time, first part-time faculty wage increase in 14 years. Hondros is relocating two campuses and has plans to add programs to increase access and to better meet the needs of its students and health partners in the local communities. APEI, which is modernizing and optimizing our enterprise technology platform to improve student experience, includes the technology transition for Rasmussen from Collegius and the upgrade of the training platform at USA. In closing, it remains my top priority to attract and retain strong leaders across APEI and our education units, to drive operational enhancements, and to foster a culture of excellence and trust among our internal and external stakeholders, to uphold the educational promises we make to over 107,000 students each year. Before turning the call over to Rick Sunderland, our CFO, I'd like to summarize by saying, while challenges remain and our efforts to address them are ongoing, our 1Q24 guidance, coupled with the fourth quarter's outperformance, signifies a return to year-over-year -year growth and profitability and improved visibility. Tangible proof points, whether enrollment trends, profitability metrics, or NCLEX scores, reflects the steps we have taken to strengthen our schools and the overall enterprise. Having exceeded our revenue and adjusted EBITDA outlook for each of the last two quarters, 
we are well positioned as we enter 2024. Our entire APEI team recognizes the significance of the challenges we have faced and are energized by how we have come together to strengthen our organization to prepare for the next phase of our journey. As we begin 2024, we do so from a position of stability with a large and growing addressable market, a committed leadership team, a distinctive value proposition, and a well-established franchise among service-minded adult learners. With that, let me turn the call over to APEI CFO, Rick Sunderland. Thank you, Angie. Looking at our fourth quarter 2023 financial results, total revenue for the quarter was $152.8 million, up 0.4 million, or 0.2% from the prior year period, and better than our fourth quarter guidance. Fourth quarter revenue growth was driven by increased revenue at APUS and Hondros, partially offset by revenue declines at Rasmussen and Graduate School. For the quarter, adjusted EBITDA was also above our previously issued guidance, due in part to lower than expected advertising costs in the quarter at APUS and Rasmussen, and lower than expected compensation costs. For the quarter, adjusted EBITDA was $25.7 million, compared to $15.4 million in the prior period. The current quarter results represent an adjusted EBITDA margin of 16.8% compared to 10.1% in the prior quarter, reflecting the modest revenue growth in the quarter, combined with lower advertising and marketing costs and lower compensation costs due to the third quarter reduction in force. Compared to the prior quarter, in total, advertising and marketing costs decreased 10.7 million year over year. Our diluted EPS in the fourth quarter was 64 cents, a significant improvement from the loss of $0.35 cents in the prior year period, and again, exceeding fourth quarter guidance. At APUS, revenue was $79.4 million in the fourth quarter, up 8.1% as compared to the prior year, due to continued growth in net course registrations from students utilizing TA and VA education funding, and the impact of tuition and fee increases implemented in the second and third quarters of 2023. <clears throat> APUS continued to achieve more with less. For the quarter, net course registrations increased 4% on lower advertising and marketing costs of $1.8 million compared to the prior year. For the year 2023, advertising and marketing costs was $6.8 million lower than the prior year. APUS, adjust, APUS EBITDA for the fourth quarter was $27.7 million compared to $20.6 million in the prior year, an increase of 34% year over year. APUS EBITDA margin for the quarter increased to 35% compared to 28.1% in the prior year period. At Rasmussen, fourth quarter revenue was $52.6 million, a decrease of 13.4% compared to the prior year due to lower enrollment during the quarter. However, the rate of revenue decline improved in the fourth quarter as compared to the third quarter decline of 15.4%. Rasmussen's EBITDA turned positive in the quarter and was $0.4 million compared to an EBITDA loss in the prior year period. Fourth quarter EBITDA benefited from lower advertising expense and labor savings from the previous reduction in force. For the quarter, advertising and marketing spend was $4.5 million lower than the prior year quarter. For the year 2023, advertising expense was $11.1 million lower than the prior year. At Hondros, Revenue was $15.8 million for the fourth quarter, up 24.9% as compared to the prior year due to continued growth in enrollments. For the quarter, Hondra's total enrollment grew 19.2% to approximately 3,100 students, the highest enrollment ever. For the quarter, Hondra's achieved positive EBITDA of $1.1 million compared to an EBITDA loss of $0.7 million in the prior year quarter. Graduate school, included in corporate and other, experienced a 10% decline in revenue to $5.1 million, primarily due to lower enrollments in the quarter. Graduate school enrollments continue to be negatively impacted by the continuing federal agency funding uncertainty over federal funding either through continuing resolutions or the passing of annual funding legislation. For the quarter, graduate school's EBITDA loss was $1.1 million, compared to an EBITDA profit of $0.1 million in the prior year period. At December 31, 2023, cash, cash equivalents, and restricted cash was $144.3 million, an increase of $14.9 million 
from year-end 2022. Restricted cash at December 31 was approximately $27.7 million and continues to be almost entirely comprised of a restricted certificate of deposit that secures a letter of credit for Rasmussen with the Department of Education. For the year 2023, cash flow from operations was $45.5 million, an increase of $16.3 million, or plus 55.8% as compared to the prior year. The increase in cash and cash flow was primarily due to higher revenue and operating income at APUS, increased payments received from the Army, including payments related to prior periods prior to 2023, and the timing of other receipts and payments, partially offset by our investment in capital expenditures, payment of preferred dividends, repurchases of common stock, and the change in billing approach in the fourth quarter for TA at APUS. Principal uh, principal on API's term loan at December 31 is unchanged from the prior year end at approximately $99 million. With unrestricted cash at, 100, at approximately $117 million, API continues to be net cash positive. Additionally, there are no borrowings under API's $20 million revolving credit facility, which remains fully available. During the fourth quarter, we repurchased $1.7 million of our common share, common stock, bringing our repurchases in 2023 to 1.5 million shares for $9.7 million, or an average price of approximately $6.40. In addition, we, repurchase, we, we repurchased an additional 251,000 shares in the for, first quarter of 2023 for $2.8 million. So over the past year, we've re repurchased an aggregate of 1.76 million shares for $12.5 million at an average price of approximately $7.08. Turning now to the first quarter 2024 outlook, APUS net course registrations are expected to be between 97,000 and 99,000 registrations, an increase of between 1% and 3% over the prior year period. At Rasmussen and Hondros, first quarter student enrollments are actual because of the quarterly starts at these schools. At Rasmussen, first quarter total on-ground enrollment decreased 11% to approximately 6,300 students, while total online student enrollment increased 1% year over year to approximately 7,200 students for an aggregate enrollment decline of approximately 6% year over year to approximately 13,500 students. At Hondros, first quarter total student enrollment increased 22% year over year to approximately 3,300 students, the highest enrollment ever at Hondros. In the first quarter of 2024, consolidated revenue is expected to be between 151 million to 153 million. The company expects net loss to common shareholders to be between 4.4 million and 3.0 million, or a loss between 25 cents and 17 cents per diluted share. Adjusted EBITDA is expected to be between 8 million and 10 million for the first quarter of 2024. For the full year 2024, we anticipate consolidated full year revenue of between 610 million and 620 million and adjusted EBITDA of between 55 million and 65 million. With that operator, we would like to open the line for questions. If you would like to ask a question, press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Jasper Bibb with True Securities. Your line is open. Hey, good evening. Um, nice results here. Uh, I guess the obvious question is, you know, you did a really strong 17% EBITDA margin in the fourth quarter, and I guess that's always kind of a seasonally strong margin in, in the fourth quarter, but the guide implies a 10% margin or so. so I guess you mentioned the growth investments earlier, but how do we bridge the 4Q margin exit rates where you're guiding in 24? Well, Jasper, the, the fourth quarter is seasonally strong. Uh, and by giving um, an indication of, of adjusted EBITDA for the year, uh, you can see sort of an a increase year over year of, of that margin. Uh, but we've invest, we're investing in a number of, of initiatives, which Angie outlined in her, in her uh, remarks. Uh, importantly, course uh, uh, improvement, faculty salaries, and technology. I think those are the three primary areas of investment 
and they're all uh, going to lead to uh, improved uh, student experience and, and improved student outcomes. Angie, would you like to comment further? I would just say bridging, which uh, would be looking back at 4Q of 23, Jasper, a couple of things just to, to highlight. Uh, first, we were able to uh, conserve, conserve our marketing spend um, and, and spent about $3 million less than we had expected. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had been uh, accruing a somewhat larger bonus accrual than what we ended up uh, spending for the year, so that saved some money and, and obviously resulted in a higher uh, performance in the fourth quarter than we had originally forecasted. And, um, and we had some revenue outperformance at APUS above what we had expected and lower expenses at Hondro. So all of those things added up to a very favorable uh, 4Q23 that was above what we had guided to before. Got it. Um, would there be any way to frame the size of those growth investments in like an absolute dollar perspective versus, I guess, what would be considered normal or what you're spending in those categories in 2023? Yeah, hi, Jasper, Steve. Uh, I think at this point, right, from a, a guide standpoint, the the, the metrics we're comfortable providing are revenue and just EBITDA and obviously CapEx. Um, you know, we're not we're not prepared at this time to kind of dig into that level of detail, um, you know, and, and bridge from 23 to 24, right? And it will also depend on some of the timing uh, of when, when that happens. So, it's, you know, there's a, there's a range that we've got internally, but I think that that's captured in, in the overall guidance range that we provided for adjusted EBITDA. No, fair enough. Figured I'd ask. Um, maybe next one for me. It looked like the receivables balance picked up quite a bit in the fourth quarter with some of the billing changes at Army. Would you expect those uh, DSOs to normalize down in the first half of 2024? And I guess longer term, like how do you plan to manage that? I think it's 26 million in, in receivables from Army for 22 and 23 um, in light of 9010 compliance. Thanks. Well, uh, Jasper, uh, we talked about a change in our billing policy effective January 1. We will see a normalization in re receivables. You'll see a decline from the year-end number. I don't think you'll see a return to where we were at June 30th, simply because we've, we've changed the timing of how we bill uh, the, the military. Okay, understood. Um, and I, I guess... Maybe at the, the segment level, and doesn't have to be like particularly specific, but just any color on how you're thinking about segment margins for your main three segments in, in 2024. Yeah, Jasper, uh, I think the way I think about uh, the, the various segments, right, we're not providing segment level detail, but we expect that we'll see improvement, um, you know, at Honjo's Graduate School and, and, uh, and Rasmus and Apis is, is, a, is relatively flat, and that reflects um, some of the investments that Angie just talked about in terms of uh, technology and, and uh, curriculum and quality improvement. Uh, so I think you should also think from a sequential flow or a quarterly flow perspective that our, our quarters will follow a similar pattern as to what we delivered in 2023. That's uh, really helpful. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Sheldon with William Blair. Your line is open. Hey, team. You have Matt Filek on for Stephen Sheldon. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, wanted to start with one on NCLEX pass rates. I was wondering if you could talk about what the main driver of the improving first-time NCLEX pass rates has been, given you have a variety of initiatives underway there. And then as a second part to that, could you also talk about what campuses may still be facing enrollment caps due to underperforming NCLEX scores, uh, whether those be self-imposed or from the nursing boards? Thanks for the question. Uh, the first I will answer by saying, if you recall earlier last year, we did hire new leadership in our nursing program at Rasmussen, and what Dr. Polifko has has implemented includes a strengthened 
uh, faculty onboarding and training to provide more visibility to helping students have awareness around uh, the importance of NCLEX exams early in the curriculum. The second was that we invested at Rasmussen in student success coaches to help uh, strengthen the NCLEX preparation that was present at the campuses already. Uh, we implemented assessments during the middle and end of the program to help give students re remediation strategies, identify uh, areas of focus, and help them uh, really, uh, really pinpoint the areas that they needed to pay attention to as they prepared for the NCLEX exam. And, um, and certainly the uh, changes to the overall uh, NCLEX exam to next gen has, has seen uh, the NCLEX scores increase across the nation. The second part of your question is which campuses are affected by enrollment caps. Uh, as we've mentioned previously, uh, Kansas has caps, but those are not related to NCLEX scores or anything that we've imposed. It's, it's simply a, a programmatic level cap, which you know we intend to um, to explore in 2024. Illinois has a cap that had historically been present as a result of uh, more about the um, the accreditation of the the full accreditation of the program than the than the NCLEX scores themselves. Recently, and we talked about this in our last call, uh, the Illinois um, Legislature and Board of Nursing have um, removed the, uh, the uh, temporary approval and Rasmussen has been granted the accreditation for its program in Illinois. And the state of Illinois has removed the, um, any kind of, of um, penalty that any any nursing programs in Illinois would have expected as a result of lower than uh, state average NCLEX scores and as a result, Rasmussen has three years now to meet the state standard for its nursing program. So those are very meaningful, important developments for our four campuses in Illinois. And then as we discussed, uh, we have uh, only had caps in the Bloomington, Minnesota ADN program which, as you heard from our voluntary action, will uh, no longer be relevant as we teach out that program over the course of 2024. Okay, got it. Super helpful overview, Angie. Thank you for that. And then just wanted to circle back on the 90-10 rule. I know it was briefly touched on uh, in a previous question, but can you just talk about the options you have to reduce risk related to the 90-10 rule in 2024, uh, especially given it looks like AP West was close to uh, exceeding that threshold in 2023. Right. So there are numerous – this is Rick – there are numerous initiatives that will um, bolster the 10 side of that 90-10 ratio, right? So sources of non-federal funds. Um, I would point out that uh, there were several initiatives that were implemented in 2023 which had a favorable impact on that 2023 number. But uh, because they were implemented uh, through the year, some in the second half of the year, we haven't seen the full benefit of that, which we'll see in, in uh, 2024. Um, there are, way, there are uh, some of the levers, which is your specific question, include uh, um, enrolling students that are not Title IV eligible, specifically international students. Uh, looking at various, um, call it student mix options, <clears throat> B2B um, reimbursement, and some um, perhaps some pricing. Um, we we note that at the that the graduate level, the um, the level of cash pay is is higher than what you see at the undergraduate or associate level. So when we talk about mix, um, it would be a programmatic mix that would uh, favorably impact that 90-10 score. Okay, thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of Raj Sharma with B. Riley. Your line is open. 
Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, stellar results. Congratulations. Um, can you, can you, uh, my first question is, you know, can you give us more color on the greater than expected profitability? Clearly you beat the, uh, your guidance uh, significantly. Was that largely advertising and marketing expenses being down or um, what other elements of, um, because your revenues were largely in line with guidance with the, can you give us more color yeah. on the beat? Yeah, broad, broadly, Raj, it's Rick. Um, you note that it's on the expense side, right, because revenue was uh, above guidance but um, not significantly above guidance. Two areas where we really saw uh, expense improvements, number one was in our marketing and advertising costs. Uh, we saw um, good momentum and great efficiency in that area, uh, allowing us to, um, to optimize or, or conserve on our expenses there. Uh, and then on the compensation side, uh, we, we, uh, the, the year end, uh, bonus accrual ended up being, uh, lower than what was, uh, anticipated earlier. And so compensation costs were lower than we expected. Um, when you look at the quarter, uh, you, you would expect margins to, to be higher than what was previously observed for the reasons stated earlier. Number one, the seasonality of business. And number two, um, the cost reduction initiatives, the reduction in force that took place in the in the third quarter. Um, I think those are the primary drivers. But Asia, want to comment further? No, I have nothing more to add. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So I can move on to my next question. That in the, in the past you've indicated a higher run rate EBITDA uh, than than you've guided to fiscal 24, and and I'm wondering. So you know you have these expenses. Uh, savings in Q4 that helped you beat the EBITDA margin for Q4 was 17, and then Q1 is 10, and then the fiscal uh, 24 is in, is even lower, higher single digits. So I guess my question is: the gains you made in 23, you know, uh, in, in the margins, are these being offset by the new investments, or is there an element of uh, conservatism here? Hey, hey, Raj, Steve. I, I, I think there's uh, right. This is the first time that we put out full year annual guidance. We're we're still early in the year, so I, you know, we certainly want to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, being too aggressive on that front. I think that the points about, you know, where we've saved, you know, we we had outperformance in the in the fourth quarter, right? We we're taking the opportunity to make sure that we're investing in in the quality. Uh, and the student experience, again, quality student outcomes and student experience. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a combination of wanting to make sure that we're investing in a prudent way uh, throughout the year and also wanting to make sure that we, we give ourselves some, some room throughout the year as, you know, to be able to adjust to, you know, changes in, in marketing and uh, market dynamics. And two things, Raj, I'll add. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, Hondros is relocating two campuses, uh, is launching the MA program, um, and we are also uh, moving Rasmussen off of the Collegiate IT platform and into the API uh, tech platform, which will have a meaningful long-term savings for Rasmussen and for APEI, uh, but that move will not be complete until the end of 2024, and so the, the real cost savings associated that, with that we will see take uh, effect um, on a full year basis in 2025. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that. So I know that you're not uh, breaking out the guidance in terms of the EBITDA margins for the three divisions, but clearly it was, um, you know, heartening to see the the positive EBITDA in um, Rasmussen and HCN. Uh, and I don't know, you're not, I know you're not putting numbers to it, but in the general direction, you expect uh, break even to profitability to continue for the other two divisions? Yeah, Raj, for, I think you're referring to Hondras in graduate school. Is that correct? No, Raz. Yeah. yeah. As, so, so, no, I think as, as it relates Rasmussen. to Raz, you know, as it relates to RAS, we're, we're expecting progress throughout the year. We don't anticipate that it will be positive on a full year basis, but we are expecting to get toward 
profitability in the back half of, of the year. Got it. Um, got it. And, and, and I have a couple more questions, I, if I may. Um, the Rasmussen Bloomington campus, the teach out, is that um, uh, driven by, uh, you know, is that driven by regulators or was that self, um, self-driven? self No, we um, made the decision, Raj, and went to the Board of Nursing voluntarily to offer to teach out that program. Uh, we saw that while we saw improvements in the NCLEX scores at that campus, the, the improvements did not meet state standards by the end of the quarter, fourth quarter of 2023, and so we voluntarily went to the Board of Nursing with that offer. And, and furthermore, it. what we are seeing in the Twin Cities specifically is that the market demand is not as strong for two-year ADN nurses as it is for four-year BSN nurses. And given the very strong NCLEX results that we have at the Bloomington campus, among other campuses in Minnesota for BSN, above 90% for our NCLEX scores, we chose to invest our energy, our marketing resources, our faculty towards the BSN program, which will better align with the jobs that are available in the Twin Cities, um, and the preferences of the health systems for a BSN trained versus an ADN trained nurse. Great, thank you. And, and that's all for my question, so I'll, I'll take it offline. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Paris with Barrington Research. Your line is open. Hi, thank you uh, for taking my questions. Congratulations on a strong finish to the year. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you a question about full year guidance. Um, uh, thank you for that, incidentally. Uh, when was the last time that you offered full year guidance? Just to refresh my memory, or if, if you had done that in the past, uh, it's usually one quarter at a time. So this suggests yeah. confidence. But, but, Al Al but Alex, we'll, we'll it's Rick. That. Yeah, it's Rick, and I'm here with Chris. We're going to test each other's memory. I think it was 2011 <laughs> or 12, Chris? I was going to say 2014. But... No, not 2014. No, because I started in 11 and 12, and I think that was the very tail end of annual guidance. Yeah. Great. Well, um, and, and then I just had uh, one specific question, uh, uh, you know, between the uh, prepared comments and the questions that preceded mine. I just had a couple left. Uh, and, and this is as a result of a quick skim of the 10K. Um, uh, the 10K mentions the planned closure of the ADN program in Bloomington, uh, uh, talks about uh, the legislative changes in Illinois, which is a positive uh, uh, for the Illinois uh, Rasmussen uh, programs. Uh, and then it also mentioned something about Florida introducing legislation that could have an uh, impact on our use nursing programs there. Can you give us a little bit more color on those uh, legislative changes or the introduction of legislative changes? Sure. And, and those things are really developing as we speak. Um, you may have seen the headlines about uh, – a nursing program in Florida that was essentially a diploma mill, and as a result of that, um, we're, we're not a diploma. It's mill. not us. No, we're, we're not, not a diploma. No, I'm saying another program. Yeah, another program in Florida. Um, they replaced the entire uh, governing board in in Florida, and obviously they have a mandate to be sure that all nursing programs are meeting the standards that the state of Florida would ex expect. And so, um, you know, we are pleased with our performance in our program campus combinations. We have one campus program combination in Fort Myers that is below the state and CLEC standards. Um, but we believe that we uh, have a strong message to deliver to the Florida state uh, nursing board, and we um, are striving to collaborate with them and make sure that we provide them all the information they need uh, to, to, you know, evaluate and have confidence in our program. How many campuses or programs in Florida for Rasmussen? Uh, we have six campuses, and as it relates to nursing, 
we total, have total, yeah 12, two, 12 total programs. yeah two programs at each campus so six six campuses with an LPN and an ADN program at each campus and PN with LPN and ADN and PN okay so 12 total Alex 12 total um, and then you just said there is there where you are below state standards on NCLEX is one campus one program in Fort Myers that's correct and uh, uh, is this proposed legislation or is it enacted le legislation and what's your exposure with that campus uh, it is it is very early in the legislative process so it is not proposed uh, that we are aware of. Um, as it relates to Fort Myers specifically, uh, that program has been below the state standard for two consecutive years. And, um, and so we're paying careful attention to the remediation plans at Fort Myers. And is this, a, is this an ADN program uh, or, or the LPN program or both? It is an ADN program, yes. Okay. And how many students are roughly in that program? That I, I, can't, um, I can't comment on. I, I don't know that number for sure, Alex. Okay, good. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks very much. There are no further questions at this time. I will now turn the call back over to Chris Simonoski for closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. That will conclude our call for today. We thank you for your time and your interest in American public education. Good evening, everyone. This concludes today's call. You may now disconnect.